Hi, I'm Jamie. And hi, I'm Lucy. Um, today we're going to be talking about those kingfishers, some owls and a rather special type of hoverfly. First of all, we're going to take a look at some of the wonderful photos that you've been sending in to Nature's Home magazine. Now this one is rather unusual, it's a leucistic oyster catcher. And you can see here it's part of a flock. This photo is taken by Joe Timmins, and I think it's absolutely stunning. This bird is really standing out, isn't it? Just look at the colours in that. It's amazing. I think leucistic has to be one of my favourite words in the, the nature dictionary. Um, so not quite all the way to albino, but um, a paler form than the, the normal colours you get of a species. And this one's perfect. So you can see it's still got a really bright red kind of carrot looking beak. Um, and then all of its plumage is that really pale white colour. It's absolutely gorgeous. And if it was albino, would it, what would the difference be? Would it be sort of pink, a pink eye? Is that how you normally Yeah, tell? so albino is um, completely lacking in pigment. Um, so um, no melanin whatsoever in any, any of the, uh, the plumage or any of the parts. So you'd expect a paler beak. And like you said, that really kind of iconic pink eye. Um, you do see leucism quite often in a lot of other species. Blackbirds, it's particularly common in. So you'll find a male blackbird with white patches all over him. It's really cool when you see it. So what's this next one? Look at this little punk rocker. So this is a crested tit. Now they're only confined to certain parts of Scotland. Um, gorgeous little member of the tit family. And you can see here this photo that Lynn sent in. It really shows off the crest that gives it its name. Um, beautiful little birds. Now they have this really um, unique little call that's quite good to get your ear in if you're up in Scotland, particularly in the Cairngorms. Um, and I think it sounds like a little high-pitched monkey squeak. I don't know if you've ever heard it, Jamie. High-pitched monkey. No, I've I've yeah. seen them. I've I've been to um, Abernethy Lock Garden and I've seen them on the bird feeders there. And there is a high there's, there is you're right. It's a high-pitched squeaky noise, isn't it? It's like a little giggle, a little giggling monkey. Oh, that's how I like to remember it anyway. <laughs> So if you're in the pine woods of the highlands, listen out for a small giggling monkey in the treetops. Now, the next one we've got here is a fungi and fungi are notoriously difficult. Uh, Lucy and I have been looking at this one for some time. Um, Adrian Reed sent it into Nature's Home and we're not 100% on this one, are we? No, um, and that's probably one of the best things about fungi really is that it's so varied. So um, there was a suggestion here that it could be velvet shank. Um, I'm not sure if it is. It doesn't seem to have quite the right ratio of stem to a uh, to cap. Um, but I mean, in in the UK, we literally have fifteen thousand species of fungi. <laughs> I reckon I could do about hundred of them. So still a long <laughs> way to go. Um, but I mean, it's just a beautiful photo. It really captures that kind of nice mossy fungal growth season of autumn, doesn't it? Down amongst it the forest floor. It does. And actually, I'll show this photo now that I took on uh, our allotment a couple of days ago. And this is another is, is another sort of mystery fungus. This is grown amongst the kale that I was hoping would keep going over winter. Um, I'm hoping it's not going to damage it, but uh, I think it looks rather beautiful, don't you? Yeah, well, I think kind of a bit creepy and beautiful at the same time. I'm not entirely sure what species <laughs> it is, um, but it's something really unusual. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it is something that feeds off possibly the compost or if there's any bits of uh, bark or rotten wood or anything in there that it's feeding off um, but yeah really cool to see. Striking looks like tiny jellyfish I think. Now yes. this next one is a really beautiful bird the, the dipper what do we know about dippers? This is my joint favourite bird in the UK I absolutely love dippers um, I mean this is a gorgeous little pose here it looks like it's possibly scratching itself and um, so dippers are our only truly aquatic songbird and um, they really are quite a it's quite a juxtaposition when you see one because they'll sit on a rock, they'll sing their little heart out, something like a, you know, like a blackbird does or a robin does, and then it'll dive underwater and fly underwater. Um, they flap their wings under there and uh, eat invertebrates in, in really clear watered, freshwater, rocky streams. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love them. You know, they might have quite dull colours if you're into really colourful birds, but I think they're beautiful. There's nothing else quite like a dipper in the UK, is there? Nothing. Absolutely not. No, no. They're right up there, one of my top ones. Now, this final photo we've got here from a, a Nature's Home Reader from Dave Barrett is extraordinary, I think. Uh, a marsh harrier has plucked a widgeon, whether from presumably from the air or off the water, I'm not sure. The other widgeon in the flock seem completely unfazed by this. They're quite happily bobbing around. And then the, to add to the drama, there's a peregrine looking on. What do you make of this one? Oh, it's just it's just amazing, isn't it? Um, it just paints a complete picture of, of both chaos and calm. Um, 
I mean, I've seen flocks of widgeon when a predator goes past if a peregrine zooms through. I don't know if you have. And they just go into this mass panic and all take to the air and all get sent up. But it seems, yeah, they're all, perhaps they just know that one of them's been lost now and they're all safe. I don't know. But brilliant photo. Amazing moment to capture. Thank you all for the wonderful pictures you've been sending in to us. We really enjoy seeing them. Uh, we try and feature them in the magazine if we can, on our blog or in videos like this one. So do keep sending those in to us. Now, last week, Luke introduced us to the wonder of autumn moths. And here's an extra little clip of a moth that he discovered the other day. This is one of my absolute favourites. It's stunning. And I'm going to pronounce this wrong. So we're both going to have a go. I think it's Merveille de Jour. I say that, Merveille de Jour. If you, say, if you sound confident, then I think it sounds good. Mauvais de jour. Um, and this one is perfectly camouflaged, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, I, if that was just there, I don't know if I'd ever spot it. I've never seen one myself, or maybe I have, and I've just not noticed. Um, but yeah, the colours on there, the way it blends in with that, that lichen, absolutely beautiful. So do keep an eye out for those um, extra points if you see one, because they are very, very hard to see. Now, something else to look out for at this time of year is, of course, our owls. And Katie from the RSPB is here with some top tips on what to look out for. Despite being very secretive in spring and summer, now is actually the best time to see owls. We have five species of owl here in the UK, along with the barn, little and long-eared. We have two species which are actually very active during this time of year. The loudest of these being the tawny owl. Now these birds are actually louder than all four other species combined. And the reason for this is territory. Adult birds will be staking their claim to their breeding grounds whilst juveniles are exploring their territories and trying to make their own claim. We also have winter visitors here to the UK and these are the shorted owls. Joining our resident birds, they will go along the coastlines and can actually be easily be seen during the day. Birds will visit us all the way from Scandinavia. You can see them quartering fields, looking for small mice and rodents. And as I say, daytime is actually the best time to see them. Now, even in cities, owls can be spotted. I recently had a lovely view of a barn owl flying right over central Brighton. Juvenile barn owls, much like tawny owls, will also be expanding their range and being encouraged to basically explore by their parents. One has been recorded leaving the Isle of Wight and ended up in Normandy, so they do have a large range which can accumulate to over 12 kilometres. So whether you are in a town, a city or a village, always do keep an eye out and listen out for our nocturnal neighbours. As Katie says, owls can turn up all over the place, so do keep an eye out and an ear out for them. Have you seen any owls in the last couple of months, Lucy? Yes, um, tawny seem to be making one hell of a racket at the moment. Um, Any time I go for a walk in the woods, I have been pushing my luck and walking as it gets to dusk and dark. Um, and just looking out for them at that time of day, you can hear the amazing, the traditional little coo, but also they have like a little <coughs> noise that like echoes through the woods. Absolutely amazing. The closest I get here is a, there is a, well, this is a sign that there are tawnies not too far away. There is a starling that regularly makes that noise. It, it's yes. clearly impersonating something that's heard locally. Uh, brilliant birds. So what we're seeing here is a beautiful little film about kingfishers by our colleague Nick Rod. And it begins with what looks like a very peaceful scene. Two kingfishers perched there, but then the aggression begins, doesn't it? Yes, that behaviour. So opening of the beak, kind of the hunchback. Um, you can almost imagine them hissing. I don't know if they were making any noise. Um, and you can really see that aggressive behaviour. They're trying to threaten each other. And look, one's hanging sense. off the other one. What's, what's going on there? <laughs> Full blown fight. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, quite a tactic to try and drag your opponent off a branch by hanging off her beak. Um, yeah, it's absolutely amazing to see. I've never seen And they can get quite brutal, can't they? Because I, I think I've seen footage before of them, you know, one of the, a, a, a pair fighting ending up in the water. Oh, wow. No, I've never seen that myself. Um, no, amazing behaviour to capture. 
absolutely fascinating <laughs> i can't believe it's still hanging on and we think they're both females don't we we think so it's yeah i think it's hard to tell i don't i'm not sure about juveniles but the way you tell the difference between an adult male and female is the males have an all black beak and the females have a little bit of reddish orange towards the base it looks like both of these do so it could be two females um not sure why they'd be fighting what their, their grief is with each other no, well, I mean, one theory could be that it's a territorial dispute. Um, another could be, uh, and this would impact whether it, they were one male and one female or two females. It could be an adult driving a, a younger one off the territory, perhaps. Yes, perhaps. I know it's quite fiercely contested over, isn't it? A good patch of river with some good fish. Yeah. Look at that blue. They're just stunning colours. Yeah, and there's the, the way they're, they're frozen now, they're posturing next to each other. Who's going to yes. win? Oh, I think we have a winner. <laughs> Seen off the competition. Absolutely beautiful footage and um, incredible birds to watch doing that behaviour. Mm, definitely. Now, we've got a beautiful little clip for you here from a video by RSPB Scotland with the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And it's all about boosting numbers of a very rare insect, the pine hoverfly. We're here today at one of our key sites for the pine hoverfly. In the whole of the UK, this site where we are now is the only place we know this species is at. So it lives within rotten holes in Scots pine trees. So the larvae live in these holes and the adults, um, when they're flying around, they're equally difficult to find. They seem to be so elusive. So that we've not had a confirmed sighting of one in Scotland of an adult for seven years. Today, what we're trying to do is take some of the animals that we've got in our conservation breeding program at Highland Wildlife Park uh, bring them out here and do a little swap with some of the wild larvae that are living in some of the stumps that you can see around me here. The aim of today is to introduce more genetic diversity into the conservation breeding program at Highland Wildlife Park and the reason for that is that genetic diversity is really important in terms of a species being able to adapt to changes like disease events, climate change and when you're captive breeding a species over time you're going to lose genetic diversity from that population if you don't bring new individuals into the population. That could be from a different captive population or it could be from the wild. have had uh, big troughs cut into them to mimic natural rock holes. These holes fill up with water and pine sawdust and they make a mulch which turns into a kind of bacterial soup. And it's that soup that the larvae, that the pine hoverfly lay their eggs in there and then the larvae hatch out and they, they eat this soup. That's how they grow big and get ready to pupate. So we're just going to have a little look in this rock hole here in this stump for a pine hoverfly larvae. Um, so we can swap it with some of the zoo's ones and increase the genetic diversity of both populations. Lucy, have you ever seen a pine hoverfly? Because I certainly haven't and I don't think many people have. I wish, I wish I'd seen a pine hoverfly. I did some volunteering in the Cairngorms last year, um, but unfortunately didn't see one. Um, but for me, they're just an amazing species. It's, it's an example of just how intricate nature is, that something could evolve with such a tight niche. It needs those rotting pine stumps in which to lay its eggs and its larvae to rear in. I mean, how unique is that and fragile is that relationship? It just goes to show how delicate the balance of nature is, I think. Um, hopefully I'll see one one day, but you never know. Fingers crossed. Well, hopefully this project will help bring them back and uh, they'll be buzzing around the trees in no time at all. This project is supported by very generous partners and sponsors, and you can watch the full video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash RSPB video. So we hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, thank you so much for watching. And we do want you to get in touch. So if you've seen anything cool, you've seen anything fish is fighting or something to beat that, please send it in to us. You can email us at natureshome at rspb.org.uk. Thank you very much for watching.